All right, ladies and gentlemen, Unit 6, the first part, we're going to be talking about industrialization and the move towards economic consolidation here. Let's read the major theme of the entire unit, the transformation of the United States from an agricultural to an increasingly industrialized and urbanized society brought about significant economic, political, diplomatic, social, and environmental and cultural changes as well. So massive changes are going to happen as the United States switches from being a mostly agrarian society to being a mostly urban society and an industrial society as well. We're going to move from the farms, from the rural areas, into the urban areas. And in many ways, the urban areas are going to expand in order to come out and find uh, the farm areas, right? We live in Bakersfield. We've seen that happen. People who used to think, they live way out on the west side of town, way out there, son, now live in the heart of Rosedale because uh, the city sort of expanded to find them. Okay, what's the big theme for today? The large-scale production uh, fueled the development of a gilded age marked by an emphasis on consumption, marketing, and business consolidation. In other words, the combining of these massive businesses together in order to create big, larger firms, as well as marketing and the consumption of the goods that they're going to produce. Let's look at our study guide, ladies and gentlemen, on the first page. Uh, the big idea here is seeing how business consolidation creates pools of wealth. So although we talked about the fact that America is dealing mostly in capital goods here, goods used to make other goods, let's keep an eye on the big picture. And that's the horizontal and vertical integration that's taking place in order to consolidate the wealth or uh, trim, if you will, the number of people in the marketplace down to the absolute titans of industry. Guys like Andrew Carnegie and John Rockefeller. Uh, Carnegie, the, the master of U.S. steel is going to use horizontal and vertical integration, really, and so is Rockefeller with U.S. oil, in order to create these companies that control not just every facet of their production enterprise, but also that really don't face a lot of competition in the marketplace and therefore are able to take advantage of that strength. Right, Horizontal integration, where you are taking out all of your competition, that's one half of this. Vertical integration, where you are taking out all of the middlemen in your production process, making sure that nobody else touches the product beside you. There's an upside and a downside. Let's talk about both. The upside of this is that you should be able to offer really low, efficient pricing. If there's no middlemen, that should mean the most efficiently low-priced good possible. and it should be in the best interest of the individual and the society of them to offer a low price on that good. Now that's the catch. The downside of this is that a person might say, if I'm the only person selling in the marketplace, then why would I possibly sell for a low price? I'm going to jack the price up because people have to buy it anyway. That's when this becomes predatory. That's when this becomes something the U.S. government is going to seek to limit over time. The idea of wealth run rampant could become dangerous for American society. There's a strong Darwinian impulse here. It is a survival of the fittest. Guys like Rockefeller and Carnegie are going to push their economic advantage to the strongest extent. They're going to want to make as much money as they possibly can. They're going to do that by driving everybody else out of business. Is that good for America? Well, it could be, but it could also be something that's predatory. Gospel of wealth. There's this idea that once you get to the top, that you're supposed to uh, help the people below you, that it's not enough to simply sit on your wealth. And so over time, guys like Carnegie and Rockefeller contributed money back to educational institutions or libraries or universities as a way of perhaps helping others who might not have every opportunity they have. Again, this is not a handout. I'm not going to give you money, but I'm going to give you the opportunity to work hard in order to get something good. A trust is a combination of a variety of different businesses for their own economic benefit. So I talked about the idea of Carnegie and Rockefeller and Vanderbilt giving each other favorable prices in order to combine their economic might. What that does then is it assures that no one else can compete with those three in those three areas. If you have the steel guy, the oil guy, and the railroad guy playing together in sort of an economic all-star team. Nobody else is going to be able to sell any of those goods. They rely on each other. They're always going to be each other's number one go-to person. Holiday Steel, let's call that my company, Holiday Steel, is never going to get any contracts because there's no way I can underbid someone like Andrew Carnegie. It just don't work.
Let me just don't work. Mass marketing, conspicuous consumption. We are going to create a lot of consumer goods as well, and it's time to sell them not just to people living in cities, but people living all around America. There's going to be mass marketing campaigns and catalogs in an attempt to sell people on the idea that they too can be fancy and they can have all of the goods that someone might have in the great big city. Okay, so we've seen in this unit here kind of this idea of consolidating the wealth together. That's the big idea. Pools of wealth. One of the factors to consider that's going to limit that are these things. Uh, let me read. I'm going to cheat right here. As leaders of big business and their allies in government aim to create a unified industrial nation, they were challenged in different ways by regional differences and labor movements. So a couple of things that are going to challenge this you know, unstoppable force in its growth, one of them is going to be regional differences, right? There's this idea of the South as being not very industrialized. Even after the Civil War, the South is going to hold close to agriculture. There are a few things that the South is going to begin industrializing. We're going to see uh, a larger cigarette industry, right? Going back to an old favorite economic uh, uh, backbone of the South, the tobacco industry. We're also going to see a pretty heavy lumber industry. We're going to see coal and iron being mined there. But the South is still very low industrial, low technological grade. Wages are low, so the urge, or I should say the impetus, uh, to upgrade and to become more technological makes no sense at all. Uh, there is no real push of education there in order to improve the workforce, and that's going to mean that the South is going to remain in many ways behind the North. So although we might talk about a new South, and the new South has some technological and uh, industrial improvements, it still doesn't have the sort of technological mastermind or you know, control, if you will, that we see in the North. So this idea of an industrial America that's all linked together doesn't work completely because the South is still, going back to a word we used two units ago now, a, a sectional area of the country. Flip the page. All right. We're going to talk here about that other thing that limits uh, the industrialized nation, right? Uh, it said that as leaders of big business and their allies in government aim to create a unified industrial nation, they were challenged in different ways by, and one of the things is labor movements. Let's talk about our two earliest labor unions, uh, the Knights of Labor, which existed to try and unify all of the workers in the world in one union, skilled, unskilled, you name it, we're going to gather them together under one umbrella in order to try and create a different type of society in which workers shared in the profits as much as they shared in the, the work. Now you're going to say, Holiday, that sounds like a socialist construct, and many people accused him of that because they wanted the average working man to be able to work eight hours a day and then to be able to read and sort of uh, educate themselves about the industrial world for another four or five hours a day and to be able to be a family man for a few hours a day and then also to rest. So the Knights of Labor are an almost way ahead of their time idea. Uh, do we have something close to that today? I suppose we do with the eight-hour workday and more of a socialist system in many parts of our government, but they're far too far to the left for a society in the late 19th century that likes to see big business and that generally views labor unions as being a pest. The more practical of the two is the American Federation of Labor founded by Sam Gompers. Gompers is a former cigar manufacturer with a great name. Gompers. Can't be. Okay. Although Terrence V. Powderly, organizer of the Knights of Labor, that's a pretty good name too. Okay. Gompers wants to see fair, equitable results for his union. What do the Knights of Labor, I beg your pardon, what do the American Federation of Labor want? Better hours, better pay, safer working conditions, bread and butter or simple unionism, basic things. They don't want everything under the sun, but they do want to be provided with those things in society that are achievable today. Don't talk to me about the transformation of a society and the rethinking of wealth and capital, because that's what the Knights of Labor are doing. Talk to me about what it is we can achieve tomorrow. Give me five cents more an hour tomorrow. Get me an hour less of work manana. Okay, I'd go off in other languages if I could, but I can't. Okay, uh, A couple of incidents here that I just want to quickly go through that reveal how things are going to go. In both of these instances, we're going to see the government intervene eventually in order to help break strikes. And in both cases, the government's going to intervene on behalf of the companies, not the workers. Okay, In the 1890s, when these events take place, America views labor unions as being kind of pests. 
They're for big business. They favor the business side of the equation. My computer screen just went blank. Oh, there's back. Hello. Okay. So the Homestead Mill. Homestead was a mill owned by Andrew Carnegie in Pennsylvania. Uh, Carnegie had informed the people at the mill that he would no longer negotiate with the union who represented the steelworkers there. And as a result of it, uh, the steelworkers went on strike and they took over the plant. Uh, Carnegie tried to break the strike using a bunch of armed guards called Pinkertons. Uh, the people who had taken over the plank or the plant, I beg your pardon, beat up the Pinkertons. And then eventually, uh, Carnegie's people got on the horn to the governor of Pennsylvania and basically said, listen, you're the governor, but we really know who controls this state. So why don't you send the National Guard down here and help me out? And they did. Okay. In the other instance, in Pullman Town, uh, Pullman is a town formed around George Pullman's sleeping car empire, where the workers staged what was called a secondary boycott. Uh, instead of uh, not doing anything. They would actually go to work, but they would not touch the railroad cars that were the lifeblood of the town's economy. So it's kind of a, it's a boycott, not a strike. You're going to work, but you're not doing a certain part of your job. I know that's a technicality and probably not one we really need to you know, dice words around. But um, in the long run, the government is going to go in with the U.S. Army and break the strike on the idea that the U.S. mail is being impeded. And because of it, we're going to see the strike end. In both cases, again, the government is favoring uh, the businesses and not the workers. So to recap here, the overall trend here is a movement towards industrialization and the changes that that brings. Okay, the pooling of wealth into smaller amounts of hands, we saw that on our first page. We see in the South that although some, some things change, many things remain the same. The South is very much the same the, as it was as far as its agricultural commitment. We're going to see new labor unions rise in order to try and challenge uh, these new industrial titans. But for the most part, the government is going to favor the industrial titans and not the labor unions. And that means the labor unions are going to have a hard time of it. In our next unit, we'll talk about changes to the city. And then we'll take a trip out west and go and see what's going on on the plains. Take care.